evident for me is when I had a job as a teenager at the opera theater, as backstage crew. And it's because working from behind the scenes in, in the theater in which mainly Italian operas happened, that to me was it. You know, wow, how can I be part of this? It is October 12th, 2021, and you are listening to episode 38 of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. What's going on, everybody? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinetist of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and host of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. Things are now back in full swing with the Indianapolis Symphony. It's been a joy to perform for live audiences again week after week. Uh, it has been a long 18 months for myself and my colleagues, and it's really been uh, a pleasure to be back on stage performing incredible music with such fine musicians. Uh, with most orchestras and performing arts organizations up and running again, I hope that those of you listening will support your local orchestras and musicians as we once again return to live performances. Uh, I'm so honored today to be joined by world-renowned conductor Miguel Harth Bedoya. Miguel recently concluded his tenure as music director of the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra, where he was the music director for 20 seasons and now holds the title of Music Director Laureate with the same organization. He has guest conducted and held conducting positions in orchestras across the world and recently concluded a very successful two-week run with the Indianapolis Symphony, where, amongst other things, we performed uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and Copland's very difficult second symphony. Um, <laughs> and after a nice dinner with musicians, he uh, graciously and begrudgingly agreed to be a guest on my podcast. And I'm so happy to have the opportunity to speak with, to speak with him today. So thank you so much for being here, Miguel. Oh, thank you for your invitation, Sam. And it's a pleasure having this time with you. And also after having listened to several of your previous podcasts, which are very, very interesting and exciting. Thanks. Yeah, it, it, we got to talking at dinner, and uh, it turns out that when Miguel is doing his exercising or walking around, he uh, he listens to podcasts. So he's been a, a listener for the last couple of weeks, which has been really cool. Um, so let's let's dive right into to you and your career. Uh, I'm always curious as to how someone becomes a conductor because you can't really start conducting, uh, you know, like you can start playing the piano or playing the violin. So so what sort of piqued your interest in conducting, and how did you wind your way there? Well, that's the same question I ask my students, because it's a very essential question to ask yourself. And as I'm writing a book called About Conducting, the first chapter is what I call the conducting bug, because it has, it has to hit you. It has to develop. If you don't have it, then you don't have the right answer to your question, because the last thing, it's, it's about me. It's never about the conductor, so it's about something else. So... And, and for me, it was about the music. And I grew up in Lima, Peru, until you know, I finished high school. And I had just a normal life. I played soccer every day of my life in the neighborhood. And, but I come from, from a musical family. I, mean, I lived with my mom, a you know, single mom. And she is a musician to this day. She's like the ultimate freelance gig musician. She would organize anything, weddings, parties, celebrations, you, you name it, choir, band pick up instruments, whatever. So I grew up listening to that and, and Latin music. And what was evident for me is when I had a job as a teenager at the opera theater, as backstage crew. So my first official job was as stage crew before mm -hmm. I even did anything. I, I grew up playing the piano and the violin, but sort of okay, nothing, nothing that I would pursue. But I didn't have the piano bug, for instance. And it's because working from behind the scenes in, in the theater in which mainly Italian operas you know, happened, that to me was it, you know, wow, how can I be part of this? And I suppose process of elimination could be one, you know, not good enough to play the violin, not good enough to accompany, not good enough to sing, to direct, et cetera, et cetera. So, but I was just fascinated in how this was put together from, from the creativity point of view, who, who is capable of combining words, lyrics, libretto, orchestration, and, and they were modest productions, I mean, right? But to me, that was it, like there was, heaven in earth already. And that was it. I said, yep, as soon as I finish high school, this is what I'm going to pursue somehow, which was not an easy task, though, but that, that, that's how it happened for me. Yeah. And do you find that, well, I guess a follow-up question, did you want to ultimately conduct opera or was it uh, just kind of like whatever came to you? Well, 
Well, at first I only knew operas because sure. even though we, we had, you know, the orchestra in Peru, the national orchestra, but symphonic music was not close to me or close to, to us. So I didn't know the orchestral repertoire. So it, it, it was just, I don't know enough about this or that, the same as dance or, or ballet. So that was my universe, was just that. But when my universe opened up immediately, the moment I set foot, you know, in Philadelphia, suddenly it's like, oh my goodness, there's a, now there's a lot of this. So, and very soon the two became one big ocean. Yes. Sort of in, in, in which the two rivers meet up and then that's, that was the, the, the feeling I had, you know, I was overwhelmed by you know, a sea of music. Yeah. So after you uh, left high school, how did how did you end up at, at Curtis? Where you is that you got your undergrad from Curtis? Is that what? Yeah. Okay. yeah exactly. Well, because we didn't have a music school in Peru that trained in orchestral conducting, so I had to leave the country, which was the first challenge. And in the eighties, you know, the economy in Peru was really depressed, and the inflation was huge. So I left to the closest country, which is Chile. Now, Chile had Pinochet as a regime, so it was also a turmoil. But, but musicians from Chile had come to play in these opera productions as guests. I remember we didn't have enough bassoon players, so there was always a foreign bassoon. Nobody played harp in the whole country, so you would have to bring, you know. And so I met musicians from, from, from Chile, and I said, yeah, there are two music schools. And of course, with the lineage of Claudio Rao, they, they were much more connected to, to the music scene. So I ended up just heading there, you know, pack up my things, save some money when I was 18. So as soon as I reached ad adulthood, I could, you know, leave on my own. And to realize that there, they also didn't have the, the studies that they actually, in principle and by letters, they confirmed that they had those, the studies of conducting. So anyway, as soon as I got to Chile, I realized I have to leave. But the best thing that happened to me upon arrival, like within two weeks, I met my wife, who's my wife now. So we have met, known each other for, you know, over three decades by now. And so that was the best outcome of that trip. And the second one is that somebody handed me a brochure, a little old looking brochure that said the Curtis Institute of Music. So I started reading and you realize it's an oral scholarship. There's this, there's the Philadelphia Orchestra. And I was determined I am going there or there. I don't have option, I don't have plan B. This yeah. is it for me. So I really prepared work as hard as I could, got invited to the audition in person. And probably for our younger listeners, this is when we did things by letter and mail. So the replies would take forever to, right. to, you know, to reach you. So it took me another six to nine months of very, very intense preparation. And I, I took the exam and I was accepted. And that really is the next chapter of my life. Excellent. And then, so you went and you studied in Philadelphia for four years. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, after you graduated, you know, I, I always feel like uh, when musicians graduate, it's not like graduating with a degree in accounting or finance where it's like, okay, now you're, now you can get these jobs. So where did you sort of go from there? Did you just start to build relationships with people? And No, no, I continue further studies at Juilliard. Okay. So okay. I did another two years. Yeah, I mean, really three, four years in the study of conducting is very little. And just to be clear, we're not talking about moving the hands. That you can learn in a week. The question is, what are you moving your hands about? So the about is what takes the longest you know, time to study. So I did two years at Juilliard. And then when I graduated, I, well, I was appointed, I was hired to be an assistant conductor at the New York Philharmonic when Mazur was just starting his tenure. So I did that for four years. And actually, in looking back, I count those four years as further training because sure. I really observed hands on what an array of conductors, I mean, from all over the world, some of them made their debut, like Tillman. He did his debut in the what was called the Young Conductor's Debut Week, and I got to witness those things. I mean, those are life lessons. So that's what it was. And at the same time, I got a job at music director of the New York Youth Symphony to replace at Carnegie Hall. So it was a very, very nice, nice combination to, to be hands-on with my orchestra and learn with the grown-ups. And in those times of four years, I only conducted the New York Philharmonic twice which was also a great lesson because you can only conduct when you're really good at one thing and make sure you do it well, rather than do too many things that are not so good because then you're done. So, and that's how it all started. And being in New York, I was fortunate to be exposed enough because when you play at Carnegie Hall three or four times a year, people can come and see you. 
because back then also we didn't have videos like we have now. Right. So nobody could tell you how you work, how you conduct. So it was the time for conductors particularly that people had to travel to see you or come to a rehearsal or to a performance. Unlike, you know, instrumentalists that can send a recording and there are very great recordings of instrumentalists that you can judge the outcome of what they do through their instruments. But for us, you know, what we do is invisible. And to some is nothing much. <laughs> and and to, uh, to your point, the you know, a lot of what you do is the interaction that you get. So you can't like, so, I mean, you can submit a tape of your conducting, but unless you're sitting there viewing the relationship and the feedback that you get from your musicians and stuff, it's hard to sort of, uh, what I'm trying to say, it's hard to adjudicate and, and figure out like what somebody's capable of, I feel like. Um, so you, you said you, you conducted the New York Philharmonic two times. I remember you told this story when we were at dinner, um, where as soon as you get your first break, uh, and you said it was, uh, Leonard Slatkin, like, Leonard missed, Slatkin, yeah. he, I, I don't know. He didn't miss the train, but he like his train got delayed. The train got stuck. Yeah. yeah. And, he um, like, no, you get 10 minutes notice. Like right. Change and stuff. right. And you said, I remember you said, you're like, if you don't, if you're not successful, then your career's basically done because yep. th then they know that they can't trust you anymore. So how was that experience exactly. for you? We, did you just like not have time to think, think about it? Well, first of all, it was a brand new piece by Richard Daniel Corp, a piece okay. called Towards the Splendid City that New York Philharmonic had commissioned. So the piece had been performed the night before, so this was a repeat concert, but it's a brand new piece that I have never put my hands on. Then Sarah Chan played the Lalo Symphony Espanol. So at least that's a piece that I had done before. But with this piece, I mean, the opening of the concert is this brand new piece. So it just had to be. This is why I, I tell my students and everybody, everybody that wants to know, conductors cannot practice. We need to understand what we do. And by the first rehearsal, it needs to happen. We don't practice with an orchestra. First of all, that would be abusive. We, <laughs> we, we learn, we grow. But you don't know. Let's see what happens. That doesn't exist. So that's how I was trained. But but at that point, I would have spent you know seven years in training for for that opportunity. It's like training for the marathon. If you run the marathon after a week of training, yeah, how far are you gonna make it? Right, oh. right. Well, that's very cool. Um, so you know, you you go through uh, New York, and I'm sure you you guest conduct uh, in other places as well. And then eventually, mm -hmm. you uh, arrive in Fort Worth. And and this is um, you know, I know when we first met, you were sort of in the middle of your of your tenure at, at with the Fort Worth Symphony, and uh, it was at Tanglewood actually. We played together. You you conducted the TMC Orchestra. And um, I remember sitting with uh, some donors at, at one of the lunch lunches, and they were from Fort Worth. They just they did their their summers in Massachusetts, and they just were gushing about you and and your and how, how great you were as a music director. So, can you sort of describe how that relationship was built over time with that orchestra mm -hmm. and, and and how it became to be? Right, and just to give you a sense of relationship, or for the listeners, the Fort Worth Symphony would have been my fourth music directorship because I started quite quite early in my in my mid-twenties with the Eugene Symphony. That's right, yeah. And so, and, and then and then with the Auckland Philharmonia in New Zealand. So, I was artistic director of the Philharmonic in Lima, but I wasn't the, it was a whole different position because the nature of orchestras change around the world, you know, like the organization, mm -hmm. the, the ranks and, and who runs, who decides, all of that. So, by the time I came to Fort Worth, it was very clear, I mean, much more evident than in the past that First of all, if you are not a person that belongs to where your orchestra is, you're not going to make your orchestra successful, period. That, that's in my case. I'm not judging any of my colleagues, no, but in my case, there's no way I could do this because I already experienced the impact of, first of all, who we are as people, we music directors and, and your musicians and your community. We, after all, are all people first before you pick up an instrument and before somebody takes up a profession or a task or something, we're people. So if people don't connect with people, then you've missed already the first step to make an organization like a symphony orchestra full time in massive scope, really move not only forward, but grow. There has to be always a sense of growth. And when people think growth means bigger, well, growth means growth, it depends how you look at it. So that was the first component that you really have to be a person that connects with every other person involved. And then there has to be a vision to the mission. You can change the mission according to how you develop, but there has to be the vision. But, but the vision has to be joint. 
The music director cannot have a vision that the musicians have that is different, that the audience may have, that the board may have, that the advice, it's not possible. There has to be only one vision. Sometimes it takes time to find it. But it was also clear to me that I was hired to lead. That's why we're called director. We have to give direction. We cannot just drift because when you drift, you eventually sink and you are done. Mm -hmm. So those elements were very clear to me when they appointed me in Fort Worth. And I say exactly the same thing. You know, if you like me to come here, this is what I think. But what about the repertoire? No, no, no. That's, that's not about repertoire because there's so much repertoire that we'll never hear. It's about the principles and the substance that will hold us as people making this together. And we, we had an agreement. And that's how, why my tenure kept extending on almost to the point of it's risky because it, to hold a relationship for two decades, is, is, it's hard, right? You, you become right. so naked musically to everybody and as a person and your flaws get bigger and bigger, which we all have flaws. So, but the principles were there. So if the principles really are the, the items that hold us, then things move forward. And that's how my tenure can be you know, resumed in, into that, those few words. Yeah, and it's been a terrific tenure, and I know you, you've hired a, a number of amazing musicians there and uh, really you know, shaped, shaped that orchestra and what, into what it is today. Uh, obviously, the role of the music director, I think, has changed over time. Um, what do you think the qualities of a music director are outside of what you do on the stage? First of all, it depends on the institution. I don't think there is a general definition across the board because that also would make every orchestra the same and right. it doesn't work so it, it has to be unique to every situation and, and you have to also remember that the conductors are the individuals that stay the shortest in an institution musicians can stay twice the length three times the length and sometimes many more than the music director so in understanding that we are part we're just a little bit part of the big curve of the life of the institution. That's how it should be understood. Not now the life of the institution has to adapt to me. That, that's just not how it just cannot work that way, particularly in, in America when, when the responsibilities are so, so shared in a certain way. But somebody has to make decisions. So outside the podium, one of the hardest things is to program. Because when you choose what to program, you really are leaving out a lot. So the dilemma is, gosh, all this music that I'm leaving out, when am I gonna have the chance to program? And why program? Because ultimately, that's the sharing of music with your audiences. So programming is not programming that we're gonna play. No, you're gonna share. So the meaning of programming, to me, has a completely different dimension. Almost like a restaurant that may give you options, right? I only remember one restaurant in our honeymoon in Italy called Il Latini. And there was highly recommended, this is in the year 2000, and you stood in line and they just let people in until all the benches were filled. Closed doors, 90 minutes, the next you know, bunch of people could come. And they just gave you food. You didn't, you didn't have an option. You, they just, that was it. They served everybody and that was it. So that would be the equivalent of going to a concert and trusting that the program is just good. And you just trust the cuisine, you trust the chef or the chef d'orchestre, you know, in French. And of course, it's a teamwork. No conductor can know absolutely, you know, everything. And, it's, and speaking of conductors, I mean, your podcast with, with Jack Everly, it's amazing. And he talks about the intricacies and the brilliances of the team that have to come up. And he's the leader. So it's, it's not that far from, from, from that. But the programming, I would say, is the most invisible part because people just see the outcome. But the, 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 the who, the why, the how long, also, are we programming for us? Are we programming for others? It's always a twofold. We program because we have to enjoy playing what, what we play. And if we don't know it, we learn it and then sharing that. So that's, that's one. And the other one is really connecting with your audiences, literally, literally. For, for instance, for us in Bass Hall in Fort Worth, it, it's the, the layout of, of the place to go and greet artists it's a bit cumbersome you kind of have to go outside and come back and security and I understand all these things and i was missing a lot of greeting audience members so i just created the meet and greet on your way out so i was the one going out to the exit 
so that if people wanted to reach me or or my soloists, the soloists, Augustine, you know, he stood out in the street with me right. several times, and and Sarah Chang and Midori, they just come along, and we are like now we're people, and we're just down here, and people have that ability to 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 share their thoughts on what you have shared with them, and sometimes it's a simple simple thumbs up, or sometimes it's thumbs down, I suppose, right? So, <laughs> and, and, and that and that takes a long time. I've met a lot. I've met more of my patrons in the groceries cashier's lane because you're actually stationary for a few moments, right? And people right. just know who you are. Conversations come in. And so that, that's a massive task, which, which I enjoy doing. And I've enjoyed doing it very much. And you see the result. You see some of the generations of audiences now because if you started when your youngest audience members were in second grade, my second graders in Fort Worth, I did a Peter and the Wolf production with dance and bilingual version. And we accounted it after 15 years, over a quarter million second graders knew the symphony. And even though they didn't know me as me, but they knew that there was a person behind. And by now there are those kids that are adults now that have families that still remember that first encounter. And that's the investment that you, you create the first encounter that is there for life. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, really cool and really great perspective. Um, so how does your, uh, role shift or do you view your role differently? Um, when you're a guest conductor with the orchestra, I remember you and I talked about programming for your few weeks here, um, mm -hmm. and how you said that the programming had to serve whatever the institution wanted and not necessarily what you, uh, wanted to do. But as far as like conducting in front of the orchestra, like, what are you looking for? What are you observing? What is, what is your initial impressions and how is your role different? Well, my, my task is a lot simpler because it, it's only about the music, as in delivering the music. So I don't know anything before. I don't know anything after what that, you know, those few days or weeks would, would, would be for my work with the orchestra, like in the case of the last two programs we did in Indianapolis. So to me, the first rehearsal really is my goal. It's not the last concert. It's the first rehearsal because if I can make sure that my first rehearsal is when everything is clear on both ends, on my end and on the sounds of the orchestra. And now then I have, now I have my mission is from that first encounter, what I call it, the enc first encounter of any piece, as a matter of fact, that we rehearse. And how far can I deliver this? How far can I grow musically and artistically in whichever the last day? You know, the Beethoven Gala, the turnaround was pretty much under 48 hours from the first note yeah. we played to the last note we played. That has a particular timing and, and goal, unlike when we have three or four days to prepare and build up you know, certain repertoire like Copeland Symphony Number no. 2, that it, it was spaced out, you know, sort of carefully and attentively to allow growth. But that's all. When I finish my work on the last dress rehearsal, honestly, I don't feel that I work during the concerts. I just come to the concerts. Then you yeah. guys work during the concerts. I work during the rehearsals and you work in the concerts. So actually, I have the best sit in the house in a certain way during the concerts. Yeah. I feel like I could have used another couple of weeks on that Copeland Symphony. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Um, well, then you do it again sometime. Right, exactly. Then you grow with, with that in mind too. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, it's interesting that you bring this up because I, with my students now, I, they come in and, oh, I'm struggling with this today. And, and a lot of times I say, oh, me too. You know, be like, I'm struggling with tonguing. Because it's music is not like a straight line upwards, right? There's a lot of valleys, and you know things change in your personal life or physiologically, and sometimes you have different struggles than other times, or some things are working and some things aren't. And so, you know, my goal is just to try to be a little bit better every day. And if I'm not better at something, then maybe I'll try again the next day. And some, you know, it's just kind of how it works. It's such an uneven path upwards. Well, that's true. There's no perfection. And I, I don't think the goal of performing music is perfection because that can happen. If we aim for perfection, then you have to define what's perfection. So, and you've hit the right point. You, you have to be your best today and you are the judge of that. Are you better than yesterday? And sometimes there are days that we can't operate the same way because we're not machines. You know, the brain reacts differently at different times of the day as well. And we have experience playing Copeland Symphony at 11 in the morning. Right. When we right exactly, and and that's just what it is. I suppose you can ask athletes the same the same way. Can you run at noon when it's ninety eight degrees? You know, and in Eugene, Oregon, for the Olympic trials, they had to move it because it was so hot. They had to do it at eleven p.m. or something like that. So, 
Yeah, just be your best and be the judge of that. Absolutely. So uh, now that you've sort of completed your tenure in, in Fort Worth, um, do you have anything else like on your on your musical bucket list? Are you are you trying to get another? You know, would you like another music director job? Would you want to do more teaching? Like, what's your uh, where's where's your career headed? Let's put it this way: I'm I've been very flexible in what I've been doing, particularly on projects. So, if you were to look at the different projects I've done with all kinds of orchestras, you know, including Boston Symphony, Chicago Symphony, they could be very traditional or very eclectic programs. So, number one is the music is what the what drives me. The, the music is in the musical composition, not the music business or the music industry, because music is music all around. You know, I work with the Camino de Link Ensemble. That's a 16-piece ensemble. And because it's 16, is it less than an orchestra of 90? Not really. You know, when, when I was chief conductor in the Norwegian Radio Orchestra, and they said, well, but we're not a big orchestra. But you're good, right? Yeah. So you can just do good music. You don't have to do big music for the sake of it. So, but to your question, I knew as I was turning 50, so I'm 53 now, that I, di I didn't, it wasn't like I want to make a change. It felt like when you grow, you can shift focus and, and align things differently. And the first thing you have to do is let go of everything you are doing. And that's how the decision of finishing the two tenures, the one in Norway and Fort Worth, came along the lines. And it also lined up with, with family plan, because that's when the time our children are finishing high school. We have one in university now. And we want to make sure that our, our, our family was held together until everybody just becomes independent. So that was part of the decision of letting go and finish also 10 years in good terms. Sure. Because you, you want to leave when they want to stay rather than you should stay when they want you to leave, right? right. Type thing. So coincidentally, you know, I was appointed at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, you know, as director of orchestral studies, and something that coincided almost almost perfectly. And guest engagements are you know coming back. And I was fortunate during the pandemic to conduct in New Zealand and Sweden and Spain as things in the states were were picking up. So as long as there's music, I'm I'm happy. Now. I do like working with people very much so because the value of sharing becomes bigger then. But there's no difference to me if I'm working with a campus orchestra because some of my, my students are non-music majors. But the impact that I will have on them is it hopefully will be lifelong. And then I'm creating music lovers that in turn. So, again, it's driven by the music. And we have discussed, we have discussed with my team, with my managers, the if the, it's always about the right relationship for music directorship arises absolutely because in the past also other potential relationships for music director have come up and you know that the things won't work and not necessarily because one is better than the other one not everything lines up to what both institution and conductor would would see as the vision so Again, I'm going to let music take me as it has been. So I'm not going to go against that principle because you know, 35 years doing this, trusting music, I'm not going to trust in that and having my family, you know, as a support, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Yeah, that's great. And and are you still residing in Fort Worth? Is that still kind of where you're calling Co home? Correct. We, we, yes, yes. And I come to Omaha every week or I go to Indianapolis or Minnesota or wherever I have to go comfortably i mean right now the traveling is resuming right the international yeah yeah um that's great and i remember um so you you actually filled in for our gala because uh, michael tilson thomas was uh, ill and 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 you you had to come but you came directly from minnesota where you i remember you described what you were doing and i thought it was so cool you were doing opera scenes in the is the baseball stadium is that where you guys were doing soccer the, oh, the soccer, soccer stadium, stadium. the Allianz stadium yeah yeah, and I think it's great because I think that um, you know not all conductors have the humility I think to do uh, different things. I think they're very uh, or the open mindedness uh, to do different things, and it's it's it, you know I, we'll get to this question next, and uh, uh, sort of where I'll leave you. But I asked you um, at the dinner, I was like, so what is what's your like if you could program anything, what would you program? And you gave an answer that I never thought you would do, which was you do the box Saint Matthew's Passion in a church, like that was your 
dream program. And it kind of took me aback. I was like, wow, that's really cool. So, um, can you sort of describe, I mean, you, you said that you just love doing music and whatever the music is like, do you have any interest in doing, uh, like more popular music or more, um, just like, as long as you like the music, like you just want to do that. Yes, because nothing guarantees that I'm going to be good at a particular piece of music, even if I like it, right? Which is which is actually the, a big problem. You think you're good at this piece of music and you're not. And you think your friends are going to tell you, Man, you should not be doing this, you know, because there are better people that can do that. So over time, there have been a few pieces that one would say these are very known, such as the Barto Concert for Orchestra, Shostakovich 10th Symphony, which I've conducted and I've retired them. It's like... I don't really do this music well. I, I really shouldn't be doing this, you know, considering there are people that, that do it so well. And, and so I start by realizing that I may just be good, you know, to so much music. But still, it's over, you know, a couple hundred works that I've, I've done and premiered over a hundred works. So it's still an insignificant amount of music in the entire literature. So I always find for what is, in particular, when, when I've not done something, you know, that so it's very hard to say, what would you wish? It almost would be, what would you like to eat that you haven't eaten before? Well, you don't know because you haven't eaten it. You haven't tasted it. Right. So it's a little bit like that. So it's not that I'm trying to get a, away from the question. It's just very hard because music really is the most important thing. Music itself, not me. Yeah. And if I cannot, for, for instance, let me give an, an example completely parallel but different. So Augustine Hadelik and I, we have performed for forever, in, pretty much everything that you can think we've played and recorded too. So he wanted to do the Ligeti Violin Concerto with me and record it. And I said, thank you, but no. And this is over the years. Thank you, but no. Okay, we do our first recording project in Norway, Mendelssohn Violin Concerto and Bartok number two, the one he won the International Violin Competition in Indianapolis. Okay, great. Let's do the second one. I can do the second recording with Sibelius and all of that. So I think Han Lin who did it. So anyway, it comes the third one. Brahms, sure, we recorded Brahms. Blah, blah. I think that would pair great with Ligeti. And I said, no way. Yeah, but it, we're already halfway, so we only need the other half. Well, it took him years to convince me to look into the piece beyond what I already had looked into, like, I cannot do this piece. Well, it's a piece that has scordatura instruments, you know, quarter tones, winds playing of carinas, whistles, and all kinds of things. But, you know, Augustine wanted me to take up the challenge. I suppose he wanted me to succeed, and it would be a joint success. So, and being chief conductor of the orchestra in Norway, you know, when we discuss these things, like, we all need to do this together. And, of course, when you look at the parts, the players, like, yeah, we're going to be in the same boat, exactly like all of you. So, we took this, we took this as a team challenge and it took a long time of just studying this to, you know, years, honestly. And finally, did it. We did it. We recorded. It happened very successful. And I probably, if the circumstances are not right, I wouldn't do the piece again because now you know how hard it is. But it was a great achievement that had not had I not have a colleague like Augustine and an orchestra that wanted this to happen. Probably, the experience would have gone in a different direction. Right. Well, I know you said you don't like to eat food that you've uh, never tried before, but or that you haven't tried. But I'm going to ask you if you can just conduct a dream program. Where would it be? You know, like, would it be a certain time of year? With who would be who would be with you, and and what would be the program? Well, one of the pieces that I've I've come to to enjoy a lot, and not, have not done it often, is Mahler Nine Symphony which I find, you know, rather intimate, considering the scope that it has and the length. The fourth is intimate, different. And that's a program by itself, just that piece. And on another note, I did this once, and I would do it over and over and over again. To me, the, the perfect opera that can be translated into what I call a broadcast version, like in a concert setting, but with narrator in this and make it in the vernacular and so is Leon Cavallo's I Pagliacci because it's an opera that lasts the length of a concert and I'm talking about an opera for an opera production that's a whole different thing but mm -hmm. this is something that you can add to the life experience of a symphony experience because it's well written for the score it already has an, a prologue it has an intermission with music it, it, so I would say those two things 
fall into that category of the wish list. If you say, here, do anything you want next week. Yeah. I would start there because the list would get long very quickly. Right. Well, that's terrific. Um, and I, I just got to, you know, before we leave, I just got to say thank you so much for, first of all, for joining me on this podcast and also uh, just for the incredible two weeks. I know that it, it was just, it was great to work with you. And um, again, after, after a while, and it was great to just have you in Indianapolis. I hope you enjoyed your stay and just, it was wonderful to get to know you a little bit more as well. So. You want to thank you. I've enjoyed my visits to Indianapolis for what, nearly two decades, I think. Yep. on and off and I was very impressed you know with the orchestra with the camaraderie with the, the warmth and, and the the desire to play that that's very palpable yeah when because when it's not there that's very obvious too so the desire of wanting to do better and of course for our listeners wanting to do better means rehearse more and repeat again until it gets better and I think we we all find the joy in, in doing that because that's the only way we, we get better. We don't get better by chance and by right. luck. Right. Well, thank you so much again for, for joining me today. Um, for more information about myself and the Candid Clarinetist podcast, please be sure to follow us on Instagram at the Candid Clarinetist or drop by our website at candidclarinetistpodcast.com. Once again, my name is Sam Rothstein, and thanks for tuning in to the Candid Clarinetist podcast. <laughs>